Hi there, folks. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Nice to see your beautiful sunny faces appearing here. <laughs> Hello. Great. Oh, yeah, and I see some faces that, that I Hello. recognize. Hi. And everyone seems to have sun kind of streaking through their window. I was a little self-conscious about this, but then I thought, hey, you know what? I'm going to soak up this sun in any way I can. <laughs> this little blast of spring that we have here before winter. Um, and it seems a lot of you have nice sunny areas too. Wonderful. Okay, I think everyone is connected now. So, um, welcome everybody. My name is Lauren Spring and I'm an art educator with the Art Gallery of Ontario. And this is one of our senior social programs. So I do know some of you have been here before. Others, it might be your first time. So I will give you a little bit of the, the rundown here. Um, once upon a time, back before 2020, these programs took place in person at the AGO. And we would walk around the gallery together and we'd look at one or two works of art and then um, go down into the AGO studio, this huge studio we have in the basement, um, and make some art inspired by what we saw. Obviously, <laughs> that ground to a halt in March 2020. And so we found this new forum and um, it's been going really well. And the big advantage is, well, there's two really. Firstly, that uh, folks can gather from way outside Toronto. So for those who might have a hard time actually getting into the city um, for an afternoon, this is an easier way of seeing parts of our collection and making some art at home. Um, and the other one is that we have kind of a bigger choice of works to draw from because I'm not limited by sort of just on what's displayed in the gallery at any given time, but we're able to bring in some photographs of paintings and sculptures and installation art um, from the vaults too that are not currently on display. So uh, that said, our plan for today is to look at two works of art. Um, one of them is, the first one is a really interesting piece. It's actually, well, I don't want to give too much away because I kind of want you to guess what it is. Um, something that is worn, uh, several hundred years old. And the other one is a much more contemporary work of art by artist Christy Belcour who is one of the most just kind of thrilling and provocative and political contemporary Indigenous artists that uh, we have in Canada. And the work that I'm going to share with you by her today is called Wisdom of the Universe. And it's actually back on display now. It was off. It was touring the world for a little while. And I was at the gallery just a few days ago and saw that it's back up. And it's really a crowd favorite. Um, and so I'm really excited to share it with you here today. And then we'll do some of our own art inspired by Belcourt's style. Are there any questions before we launch into things more officially or anything that anyone just feels like sharing? All good? Okay. So here we go. Here's a picture of the beautiful Art Gallery of Ontario. So obviously located in downtown Toronto, the doors are reopened now. And it is well worth a visit if you're not too far from the gallery. It's, um, we have a lot happening there right now. We're making up for lost time. So we just had a big Warhol exhibition and a Picasso show about Picasso's Blue Period just opened. Uh, that's the one that I spent a long time with uh, last week. And we have up on our contemporary galleries, we have a really great exhibition called Fra Fragments of Epic Memory which brings together essentially this really fascinating photographic series from the late 19th century um, of photographs that were taken in the Caribbean and then matches it with a lot of responses from contemporary artists living in and around Toronto. And so there's a bit of everything. There's photography, there's video, uh, paintings, collage, really everything. Um, and a really, yeah, fascinating, fascinating uh, exhibition. We also have uh, Matthew Wong is still on, on the first floor, so he was an artist, I was just talking with a colleague about, um, uh, he's from Alberta, and, and Matthew Wong spent a lot of time in Alberta, so also on the blue theme, in any case, there's great things to see in the building. We have Melody here saying, this is my first time, uh, thanks so much for this free workshop, hopefully, yes, we do hope, I think we have plans into the new year to be still doing this virtually for those who um, you know, concerned about a fifth wave and, and just groups are a little bit more complicated to arrange, even though the gallery is open for individual and family visits now. 
But um, I do think the future is bright, and I do envision us gathering in the space together at some point soon, too. Great. So I also just want to take a moment to acknowledge that the land the AGO is on is Mishi Sagik Nishinaabe territory, Mississauga. It is also governed by a treaty between the Mississauga of the Credit and the Canadian government. Toronto is Mishi Sagik Nishinaabe territory. It has also been occupied by other Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat confederacies. And I also want to thank, speaking of um, being grateful for this free workshop, I also just want to give a big thank you to Amica Senior Lifestyles, our lead sponsor of the Senior Social, for generously supporting this program. All right, so here is the first work that I'd like to share with you. Um, and it's a bit tricky in a photograph because it's hard to get a sense of the scale, but you can see here on the side. So it is 35.5 um, by 1.3 by 117 centimeters. So really quite quite a big piece. And I'm curious, maybe some folks have actually seen this in the gallery in person. And if you have, or even if you haven't, what do you think is going on here? What jumps out at you about this particular work? And I should mention too that you're welcome to type into the chat. That's totally fine. If you also want to unmute yourself and respond with your voice, um, that's more than welcome as well. So Courtney in the chat is saying, I had one like this, but I sold it. Oh my, really Courtney? I wonder if you sold it to a museum because I think a place like the AGO, if it was really one like this from, uh, um, from you know, mid 19th century, I think <laughs> AGO or other museums would probably be interested in it. Uh, I sold it actually through Waddington's. Ah, okay. So, and it was quite similar to this? Yeah, it was very, very similar. I uh, fire bag. Wow, very neat. So yeah, it is. It is a bag. That's right. And you can imagine, sort of looking at it, it's one that's worn across the body. And um, we have a few more comments here. So Janet is saying the first thing I see is its stunning beauty. Yeah, it is really striking, isn't it? And yeah, thinking about nature and lush spring. Those are great, great words. And it is, yeah, it is kind of overtaken by these plants, right? And we've got certain leaves that we might recognize and other sort of brambles and branches and maybe some fruit here and flowers. So, and someone else is saying here, it looks like the designs are front and center. It seems like it wants to be seen. Mm. Yeah, that's a really interesting comment. Yeah, that's not a sort of, you know, floral backdrop to some other kind of main object. The, the, the main focus really is nature here. And it seems in really good shape for its age. Yeah. Oh, and Courtney's telling us more about her bag. So my great-grandfather bought it in the 19th century. They were a common trade object. Awesome, Courtney. You're totally right. I wonder, do you want to share maybe a little bit of the history of, or what you know about these ones? Um, then it's not just my voice talking all the time. Do you know kind of who was trading them and what, what they were all about? I had it examined once by the uh, ROM. And they said it was Ojibwe beadwork mm -hmm. and that they were used um, as far uh, traditionally, they were used as fire bags to carry obviously implements for uh, making fires. Mm -hmm. But later they were made without, uh, without any backing, like there was no bag behind it. And they, they were just used as um, a commercial object. But this one, like mine, had very intricate beadwork and um, was done, the, the black part was velvet. It was uh, very beautiful. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, and it sounds like there's a lot of similarities. And, and some folks might not have even realized, because again, this is a relatively small picture. But it is this one too, the black part here is velvet. And that's pretty much the only material that we have, like fabric material, because all of the colors here, the white backdrop here, the blues, the greens, everything here, these intricate designs are all actually beadwork. So Courtney would know this having felt it up close and personal. Um, but often, you know, when I'm touring with groups in the gallery and they see these hanging on the wall, 
it's really hard to tell because the beads are so small. They're these really tiny little glass seed beads that were actually brought over by the British. And so, as Courtney was saying, yeah, it was a trade object. Um, and it really represents this, this fascinating sort of cultural sharing, really. Because when the British came over, um, a lot of the really important generals in the army would have a bag like this, one that went across their body, it was not decorated in this, this type of way with, with um, the beads or with the flowers, but just kind of the shape of the bag. And um, yeah, it would be sort of a higher status symbol because the generals would have to carry, you know, ammunition and maps and other things. And so slowly when the cultures were, were conversing, um, you know, some folks in the indigenous community were saying, well, maybe we should have a similar bag for people with high status in our community to show this, to show off that, you know, they're powerful people and deserving of respect. And so they started modeling these bandolier bags after what they had seen with the British army. But um, the Métis people, and then it spread to other indigenous groups too, um, the Métis people were considered sort of the flower people because they knew so much about the medicinal properties of plants and roots and, and um, leaves and everything. Those are really sacred medicines. And so they said, okay, well, when we're making these bags for you know, a chief or an elder in our community, it's not just gonna be a plain old bag. Like we're gonna actually invest a lot of meaning in here. And one of the objects that the British had brought over were these little glass colored seed beads. Um, indigenous folks did do a lot of beadwork before contact. And you can see down here at the bottom, um, there's an example of kind of more traditional indigenous beads. And they were made out of shells primarily. So sometimes out of mussel shells, you can see kind of purple and white here. Um, and so, much harder to work with essentially because you'd really have to <laughs> you know kind of get the material into a beaded form and so suddenly uh when the british brought over these little glass seed beads that just opened up a world of possibilities too in terms of what could be more easily represented and so that's why they opted to uh, include all of these plants and flowers it was not just a decorative thing but it was also this real symbol of power because these were such powerful medicines and then interestingly, just like Courtney was saying, after some time wearing these bags, they realized actually it's not really the practicality of a bag here that matters. What it is is the, the symbol. And so they stopped actually opening them. So a lot of what are called sort of bandolier bags in our collection aren't actually bags. They're just sort of something that would strap across the body and then you have this rectangular shape um, that, uh, that could be a bag, <laughs> but um, doesn't actually open. So. Um, yeah, really interesting sort of kind of cultural sharing in that case. Oh, and then, so Courtney's saying too that the glass beads had little value but were traded to Indigenous people for more than they were worth. Yeah, certainly. I think, yeah, if you, you delve into the, the history of trade, it would have been a kind of a fascinating and interesting artistic object, but uh, exchanges were not necessarily fair in terms of what was given in return. So this... Um, this one, again, we don't know the exact name of the artist, but this particular one has been credited to a Métis artist, most likely a woman. It was it tended to be women that were highly skilled in this domain. And you can see, yeah, dating back to 1850. And now, if we fast forward in time, we have Christy Belcour, so contemporary artist, alive and working and just doing the most fascinating stuff these days. And she herself is Métis and was inspired by objects like the bandolier bag we just looked at and other traditional Métis beadwork to create really her own aesthetic. And this one that we have here was commissioned by the AGO. You can see it was made in 2014 and is huge in scale. It's almost kind of like mural size if you were to see it in the building. And before I uh, share with you some of the things that I find most fascinating about this piece, I'm curious to hear from you what you notice. What, what's going on here? What jumps out at you? You might imagine maybe questions too, like if, if Belcour was here right now and, and wanted to uh, engage in conversation, what might you want to ask her about it? So Lori here is saying, it's as if it's a single related organism, gorgeous. Yeah, I agree that it's kind of a breathtaking piece. And it's, you know, when you first, if you just look quickly, you think, okay, well, it's maybe like a forest scene where we've got these 
plants over here, and then you realize, oh, they're all actually connected to the same branches or roots or whatever it may be. And obviously you'd never see that in reality. So there's this really interesting sort of um, element to this piece where it's very grounded in reality because every one of these plants, every animal, every root, every petal on every flower is based on a real life living thing. Um, and yet, obviously, they'd never be connected in this in the same way on the exact same plant. Uh, oh, yeah, and others are, yeah, admiring the beauty. Someone is noticing the symmetry, too. Yeah, that's quite extraordinary. The middle section here, this, where the line of symmetry is, is not exactly symmetrical. And we have this little maybe piece dove right here, but then everything else um, really is symmetrical. So it looks like it could just sort of be folded in on itself and be the mirror image. So yeah, kind of painstaking symmetry here. Um, and Simone is saying that nature seems to be part of the universe with the stars in the background. Yeah, that's also what really makes these colors pop, isn't it? That it's um, on this, this dark black background, much like we just saw in the original one on the velvet. Other aspects were white, but I find, yeah, that, that kind of black velvet backdrop really makes the colors pop. And uh, yeah, and there's the dove in the center. The branches are like veins. Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of artists that I've been paying attention to recently, I don't know if it's just everything happening in the news with climate change and wherever maybe artists are shifting their focus, but there's certainly right now um, this really beautiful sort of aesthetic representation of the human body and art. And certainly, yeah, the way that if you would just find, pick up an autumn leaf off the ground and you just think, oh yeah, all those veins really look like, you know, and the human body or just the way the blood flows through us or you know certain trees that look a lot like lungs with with all of the the little hairs and and everything going in different directions so yeah i think there is something about sort of life in general here and how humans and nature nature mirrors each other cindy here is saying it's beautifully intricate yeah feast for the eyes the red ferns seem to be the heart of the organism yeah they certainly pop out and there's not yeah, there's not uh, tons of other sort of areas where there's such concentrated color. And yeah, those, the red there is really striking. The bird flight, freedom at the center. Totally, yeah, yeah, it could be. And I saw someone else said maybe peace, freedom. It is a nice sort of position of the bird. It's not, doesn't seem to be fleeing something, um, but more sort of a flight of delight in some ways. And yeah, the blue roots also look like veins. Um, yeah, it could also be referencing maybe the tree of life. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and the colors, yeah, seem to almost pop out of the canvas. I think that's quite, uh, quite apt as well. And it is, it's one of these pieces, as I mentioned at the beginning, that is really sort of a crowd favorite. And I think one of the reasons for that is the scale. So if you're just sort of walking in the gallery, you can't miss it, right? You turn your head and you're just like taken in by this work of art. But then Christy Belcour has done some really interesting things here too, where she's hidden little things. So we were mentioning the symmetry before and how, you know, the left and the right side seem very similar. There are actually little differences hidden in there. And it's hard for me to describe as clearly as I can using this um, on the slide because the image isn't as big as it would be if we were in person. But I can point out a few and you might be able to see them on the screen. So if you take a look really carefully, the robin here on this side has a little worm in its beak, and this one does not. And then if you check out these little hummingbirds sort of way at the sides, this one has a red chest, the male, and this one here has a, a, gray, a gray chest here, the female. Oh, Margaret's able to do some writing on here. Maybe she's pointing something out here. Um, Great. Oh yeah, and, and Melody here has saying so. She has a quote from Christy Belcour. This painting is a mirror reflecting back all the beauty you have inside. Every kind and compassionate act, every time you cared, every act of generosity and gentleness. Yeah, that's really nicely said. And I think there is something that's kind of celebratory about it. We were talking about, yeah, this sort of life force and how humans might recognize themselves in these shapes and patterns and yeah, I think that's that's really a life-affirming thing to say and how, how nice to be able to look at this painting and see yourself and your own kindness reflected back in there. Um, 
And so I'm curious to know, given that there are these sort of small little differences from side to side, I'll point out one more here that you can probably clearly see on this blue leaf here up in this top corner. You can see there's a little caterpillar about halfway up the leaf. And on this one, it's a wee bit higher. So given that she kind of hid these little differences in there, um, my question for you is why do you think she would do this? Why would she have, have kind of uh, snuck these things in here just when you think it's totally symmetrical? She wants us to go closer to examine it. I like that idea, yeah, to, to spend time with it, right? So often in a yes. museum, you know, there's studies have been done and actually on average, people spend about three seconds looking at a work of art in a museum. And so I think she, she wants a reward. It's like, yeah, a little, little incentive and a little reward for those who spend some more time with it. Um, yeah, it makes you look a bit closer, someone else is saying, it makes your eyes wander. Yeah, and it's exciting, right? When you start to notice this, you think, oh my goodness, there must be more. My little three-year-old daughter has a bunch of these books. She loves doing like spot the differences things. And so this is one that, um, you know, you could really just spend hours with trying to figure it out. Uh, Yasmin here is saying, yeah, because nature is not uniformly symmetrical. That's key too, right? We think of, um, we tend to simplify nature, but if you look carefully, certainly like one maple leaf is not like the other. We always hear that about snowflakes, but it's the same with leaves on a tree, with everything in nature, is it's not perfectly symmetrical. And actually, it's sort of that imperfection that makes it perfect in a way, or, or exactly what it is. It's not perfect, it's just nature. And that's something that we have to accept in the world and ourselves. Um, yeah, oh, great. So yeah, and Janet here is saying, tiny imperfections add to its perfection. Very nice, that's kind of what I, I was just going on too. I love that, tiny imperfections add to its perfection. Yeah, little in the natural world is perfectly symmetrical, for sure. It also reminds uh, uh, Brina of children's learning tool. Oh yeah, we're, we're all on the same wavelength today. I've, I've been saying some things that people are saying in the chat at the same time, for sure. Yeah, life can be in the detail. Yeah, how often do we get caught up in that too, don't we? We think big picture, I know I'm guilty of this. I tend to be like a planner and there's a lot of things that have to be done in the day and um, it's so easy to forget to just be present. And I know, I think, uh, you know, <laughs> generally in popular culture, we're moving toward more mindfulness about that and trying to be present, but it is a struggle. And uh, a work like this kind of demands that and is a fun way of, of focusing in on that. Life can be in the detail, yeah. Not all of nature's elements are symmetrical, totally. And our faces are not symmetrical either. Yeah, that's a great thing to point out. One of the beautiful things that um, at the AGO, we have a number of programs where educators like myself get to work um, in tandem with Indigenous artists. And one of the artists I worked with, um, this was back before the pandemic, but he had a, some beadwork on like a beaded bracelet and he was talking about this piece and then sharing with his bracelet too, saying that in a lot of um, indigenous beadwork, there's one bead that's kind of out of place that doesn't go with the pattern. And uh, that's on a purpose. That's kind of to show, uh, to show us that life is not, you know, it doesn't go according to pattern as much as we plan. And actually that is what makes it more beautiful and makes things richer and much more interesting. And so the, you know, I think <clears throat> Belcor, because she was very highly inspired by this beadwork is also incorporating some of that in here too that yeah just wait no it's not symmetrical and actually that makes it more interesting and, and more perfect in some ways she has a really fascinating life story too she was um uh born metis but oh and someone else here is saying oh there's something similar with arabic uh yeah have a fault deliberately in their carpets i have heard that as well too yeah, and so I think it's so interesting that as a species, humans have recognized that this is something we all struggle with. <laughs> Maybe we aspire to be perfectly whatever in, in some way, and yet in our art, we're representing aesthetically like, hold off, just let us, uh, yeah, take in that, that things are not always perfect, quote unquote perfect. Um, 
And so, yeah, so Belcour was raised, uh, she was born Métis, but um, in her early years was somewhat disconnected from her culture. And then later in life, as a teenager, young adult, started really um, becoming more and more interested in learning about Métis culture. Did my screen share just stop? Hmm. Yes. That's bizarre. I wonder, Nathan, do you have it there too? And you, could you share the slides as well? Sure, let me see what I can do. Okay, that would be great. I'll keep talking in the meantime. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, and so she became, one of her first ways into learning more about her Métis roots was through nature, um, because she did start to recognize that Métis folks were called the flower people, and so she wanted to learn more about these medicines. And so even before becoming an artist, she actually published a few books about the medicinal properties of these plants. And, um, you know, became more and more connected with beadwork, started to recognize how this was representing um, some of these medicines too, and then began to paint. And so when, as soon as Nathan brings the slides back up, we'll, we'll see we have some details too. We, we just saw the really big one. But if you were to see this work of art in person, um, you'd notice that, wait a second, that looks a lot like beads. If we go, if you can just go to the next slide, Nathan. There we go. You can see that the entire thing is made up of little dots. And I'd say about kind of 95% of the people who I tour with there, um, right in front of this work, uh, right away think that it's beads. Even if they don't know about the bandolier bags, even if they haven't heard anything about Métis beadwork, um, right away they think, oh my goodness, it's actually beaded. And in fact, it's not. It's acrylic paint. But Christy Belcourt did want people to, to sort of uh, go in that direction and imagine it could be beaded. Yeah, and you can see another, yeah, they're really quite extraordinary. Um, and so I'm curious, anyone have any idea how she would make all of these tiny little dots of paint? What kind of tool she might have used? Any guesses? Toothpick, yeah, good guess. Definitely possible. And she actually, it's funny, she, she went through a few different materials. I think the first time she started with like the back of a paintbrush, which is what I'm gonna use for mine today. Yeah, maybe an eraser on the end of a pencil. Good one. Oh, yeah, there we go. Catherine got it, yeah. You must have heard a similar interview as I heard recently. So she um, finally used a knitting needle and she had, you know, it's funny because she one day went into this art and supply store and basically said, like, listen, this is what I'm doing, but I can't, like, what do I use? What do I use? And the person who working there kind of said, well, have you tried, like, the end of a knitting needle? She said, no, but that's perfect. It's the right texture. It's the right shape, everything. They're cheap um, to buy. So, yeah, ultimately she ended up using the end of a knitting needle. And so, yeah, really quite extraordinary, very, very intricate work here. And in order to do this particular painting, there's a great YouTube video of her doing this if you want to see more of her process, but she painted the whole canvas black. And then essentially, um, she used a pencil. She had an idea of what she wanted to do on it, used a pencil and did every little dot on one side of the canvas in pencil. Then had a piece of tracing paper and poked through, she put it on the canvas, poked through where all the dots were then flipped it around, poked through with her pencil again to match up so the sides could be more or less symmetrical, and then went ahead and added the colors. So really painstaking process. Um, Adiat is asking if I know how long it took. I think I, I remember watching that process video, and I think it was about five or six months of sort of full-time work. It was certainly an extraordinary long time. And... Uh, um, yeah, so, and she continues to do this. This was, um, you know, when she started working in this style, it really took off and it really, for her, became this, it's art, but it's also sort of this really meditative process that also brings her closer to, um, to nature and the plants that she loves. And so she, um, yeah, has continued. So this is kind of one of her main aesthetic things that she does. And interestingly, Someone is saying, uh, there is a monarch butterfly chrysalis in the blue light. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? And it is. It's one that, too, if 
because she's so um, closely linked to the environment too, and she's done a lot of political work lately too about water rights and um, uh, other political things that I'll get into as well, but, but certainly very, very closely linked to nature. And so it rewards those of us too, and I think many of us during the pandemic have had a whole new appreciation for nature and walking in ravines because it was one of the only things that wasn't closed. Um, and so I certainly have learned a lot more about plants in the past two years than I ever really thought to before. And so it's so nice to then see them reflected here in the, um, in the painting as well. So interestingly, I'm curious if anyone um, might have also seen some of these designs on dresses ever. Anyone heard a little bit about this? Feel free to unmute yourselves or just type into the chat if, if so. Because um, a number of years ago, Christy Belcour received, apparently according to her, it was like a series of emails that she didn't take seriously um, and thought were sort of a joke. And then a phone call ultimately from Valentino, the house of Valentino, the famous designer, who basically approached her and said, I want to use some of your designs. I want to collaborate with you and turn these paintings that look like beads into actual beadwork on dresses. And at first she thought like, why? Like she's not interested in high fashion. She was very skeptical of sort of, you know, the impact that a lot of fashion houses have on the environment. And oh yeah, someone else is saying they've, yeah, someone, Janet and Simone have seen, heard about this. Um, and so initially her impulse was to say no, but then she spoke more with, with the company and, and, learned that they actually did have a pretty good environmental record comparatively to other fashion houses. And then she also said that she really appreciated that they wrote to her and wanted to collaborate because so often we hear on the news of, you know, designers, I think there was a case at H&M recently, Urban Outfitters maybe, other, um, other designers or big stores or companies that sort of, you know, kind of rip off Indigenous art that they've seen and then just turn it into their own, um, fashion items that they sell for whatever price they deem uh, uh, they'd sell for. And so that's been, you know, for a number of years, that was really problematic. And there were many cases arising in the news. So Christy Belcourt sort of thought, okay, well, maybe if they're reaching out to me, this can help set a precedent of the types of collaborations that can take place. And then also um, for her, they offered to, to pay a very fair amount of money that then she could reinvest in community projects. So one of the projects that she's been working on lately is Walking With Our Sisters, which is about missing and murdered Indigenous women. And this is kind of a, a cross-country, um, very large-scale project that involves many, many, many community members and, and you know, with a very sort of uh, sensitive topic. And so it could you know, having that sort of money could fund these projects and then not just commission people to do works of art to contribute, but also make it into, you know, actually have exhibitions that were also at the same time kind of healing, um, healing opportunities for folks. And so uh, that was quite appealing to her too. And so if you do, after we're finished today, if you do feel like Googling Christy Belcour or Valentino, uh, you'll see some of these really beautiful dresses. I think it's Nicole Kidman, I think, who wore one a number of years ago. And they are, they are really, really beautiful. So why don't we move into our art making component now? Um, unless there are other questions or, or thoughts about the, the pieces that we've looked at so far, anyone or just anything anybody wants to share about them. That's okay too. So in that case, I'm going to share my screen in a different way so you can see. Let's hope this one works. There we go. So you can see my setup. So if you have a black piece of construction paper, yours can be even more Belcour like. I'm going to work with, I have a few options here. I have this purple, um, but I think I'm going to start just on cardboard. So it's just a little bit to, to practice a similar style to what she's what she's been doing. If you'd like to, you can find inspiration perhaps from a plant um, or tree or something that's, that's near and dear to your heart, maybe in your backyard or in your local park. Um, 
And we're just going to try. So I'm going to use the, the end of a, a paintbrush here. I have a few different ones, slightly different sizes, different colors. If you have toothpicks, that's totally fine. If you have um, any other thing, you know, you could also use the tip of a pen if you don't mind getting your pen a little <laughs> painted on, pencil, anything at all. You're welcome to experiment. A Q-tip might work too. So totally open to whatever you have. Your dots can be small if you're using a Q-tip um, or a toothpick, larger if you have a Q-tip. Uh, totally up to you. And we're just going to uh, dip it in. I'm going to show you mine and just do some dot painting. I'm going to focus on my family moved recently and we moved in the winter. We moved into our new house last January and we purchased it in November and so we had no idea kind of what the garden looked like and so this summer was just this real discovery of what was actually out there and one of the beautiful surprises was this little lilac tree bush. I'm not sure what you actually call it that uh, just was like full bloom and just smelling so good right, right on our back deck. So I'm going to do some lilacs. And there's also one of my favorite plants in the world is lavender. So I'll, and lilac and lavender, <laughs> kind of similar shape actually when you think about it, and similar color. So I'm going to focus on, on those ones with my little dot painting here. But I'd love to hear from folks either in the chat or using your microphone um, what plants you might like. And you can, you can either aspire to paint those ones today or you can just share the plants that you like and paint something totally different. I, for myself, I've done a few programs where we've been inspired by Christy Belcour, and whenever I do this kind of dot painting, I absolutely see what she means, how meditative it can be, and how you don't have to rush it. It's one of those things you could really, since you're not really blending colors or anything, you could sort of start one day in one moment and, uh, and then do as much as you can and then come back to it when you need a little time to breathe and just focus on dots. And if anyone would care to um, share anything that they've created so far, we just have a few minutes left, but I'd I would love to hear from folks sort of what kind of plant they're thinking of painting and see how your dots are looking so far. If anyone feels so inclined, you're welcome to just unmute yourself and let us know and then we can spotlight your video too if you'd like to hold it up. But if not, that's just fine too. Also, oh, someone here is asking, oh, we've got some great ones here. So someone is saying they're doing a weeping willow tree. They're so enchanting. Oh, totally. Willows are some of my favorite. Hydrangea and geranium would be ideal. Yes, I can absolutely see that working well with this particular aesthetic. And Margaret is asking, have you diluted your paint or are you using it straight from the tube? Yeah, mine is not diluted. They just happen to be lighter colors. So it's just acrylic paint um, straight, from the, straight from the little tube here. Not at all diluted. I think it's just probably the, the sunlight here that's making them maybe look a little less vibrant and, and they are kind of pastel y colors, but no, I've not I've not diluted mine. But could also be something to experiment with. Do I hear someone trying to share something with us here? Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so, so Simone here is sharing some techniques here. So if you're using regular acrylic paint, you have to dilute to get a runny consistency. Yeah, so if you want to, I opted not to today because um, I thought for dot painting, it doesn't need to be too runny, but definitely a good tip. And some of you might be quite more adept than I at using acrylic paints too. One of the things I found this week, um, I'm not sure if the plants were sort of uh, maybe confused by the, the warm spring-like temperatures we had, but suddenly our, our lavender that had been seeming to prepare for winter has just rebloomed. I'm hoping that that's okay for it. Again, I'm new, to, I'm new to gardening, but it's certainly nice to have it kind of blooming again. Clearly, many of us are using paints, but obviously this could be done too, sort of more pointillism style if you had just pencil crayon, um, even just a regular pencil, that's totally fine as well. The nice thing that I'm noticing is that even though I'm using the same tool here, each dot is a slightly different size and it's not always um, able to be controlled, which is also perhaps a good metaphor for life. Doing things the same way doesn't always result in the same outcome, even if you are someone who tends to be rather controlling like I am. <laughs> Finding myself, I have to sort of fight off the impulse to almost, you know, make it into a line. <laughs> I wonder if some of you are feeling that too. It's what's so fascinating in Christy Belcourt's work is that really it's not, there's no lines. Everything that appears to be a line is actually a series of little dots. When I see Simone is uh, signing off. Thanks so much for being here too, Simone. It was great to have you. And yeah, we have just about a minute left of our time here together. Is there anyone who'd like to share what they've created so far with us? I can share. I've done it on an iPad though. I hope that's okay. Oh, but I see others are, are maybe sharing too here. Are there others? Yeah, iPad one would be interesting too. Oh, we, I think I see someone here. Oh, nice. Oh, look at that. Look at the leaf. The leaf. Beautiful. Oh, nice. Nice. I, I've been working on this palette, like, and I just put on color whenever I feel like it. So I'm not, don't know the direction I'm going, but I thought it would jump out. Now, can you see it? Yeah, totally. That's excellent. And Thank I really, you. yeah, and that's an interesting combination too, because you had this this backdrop already in this little leaf. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Looks like Yasmin is holding theirs up too. Oh, very. Ooh, that one's kind of. When I look at it, it seems like it's moving. Uh, I mean, it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean. <laughs> I didn't have paint, so I used pastel. So. The marks are not exactly pointillistic, but still, it feels a little bit organic. Yeah, and I mean, I know your hand is moving, but I meant you captured really nice like movement with the with the dots and the lines too, like it's like dancing almost. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. Oh, and we have Lori's here too. So this is pastel too, and they weren't really popping. They weren't really popping on the dark paper. So I gave each one a little highlight as well with a lighter color. It's really hard to see, but it, it's a cut leaf begonia. Very nice. Sort of. <laughs> sort of. And, and you know what's interesting is I see, I can see the flower, but it's, it reminds me of Belcourse too, that there's something like universe about it. I almost see like hmm. night sky and, and solar system somehow too. Thank you. Yeah, that was fun. Wonderful. 
Well, we're, we're at our time for today, um, but I really appreciate all of you being here. I was so thrilled to see what you've started to create too. Of course, you have the rest of your day if you have the time to continue working on it. Um, and my colleague is just going to put in the chat a little link to a survey. If you're able to, um, uh, please fill it in. These senior socials are ongoing. We have them booked at least for the next few months virtually. And so we always want to hear your feedback about what you loved about the session, what you wish was um, a little different, what you might want to change. So your feedback is most welcome. And uh, yeah, I always have such a great time here with you folks. So thanks. Thanks for being here and for your great questions and all of your participation. We'll see you next time. Bye.